Christ is risen. This is the time, that season of the year in which we greet each other with those familiar words, Christ is risen, indeed he is risen, or risen indeed. As Christians have for thousands, thousands of years. At this time, I'd like, I always like us to kind of revisit this short saying. In many ways, it's an encapsulation of our faith, of our hope, of what we believe and what we do. We say it kind of quickly, but it, it, we always kind of need to keep in back of our minds that even though it's short, even though it's, it's brief, and we say it frequently and quickly, that it's uh, an encapsulation of our faith. We start off with Christ. Christ is written. The first word is Christ. Implicit here. Implicit here is that Jesus is the Christ. No Christian really kind of makes any sort of conclusion. Already, we kind of start from the very beginning with a central concept. One of the high points of the Gospels prior to the cross, prior to the resurrection, prior to the time in which the disciples' eyes were opened through the Spirit so that they truly understood with whom they are dealing. One of the high points comes when Christ is asking the disciples who people say that I am and who do you say that I am. And when Peter tells them, you are Christ, the son of the living God. This is where we start from. The high point of the faith, the faith upon which the church is founded. Of, if you remember the words of Christ to Peter at that time. The son of the living God. And when we remember Christ, we also inevitably remember the Trinity. God is always one and three, three and one. You are Christ, the son of the living God. The living God in that context is the Father. The disciples were not yet cognizant. They did not know of the Spirit as such. When we think about the Father, we are reminded of what we, are, we have read this morning. When we start with Christ, we have to keep in mind what we just heard. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. By the very fact that we are acknowledging Christ, we have already been called by the Father. When we think about Christ and, and the Father, we always think about him who is together, is worshipped and glorified, as we say in every creed and so many prayers, the Spirit, the Spirit who illuminates us. But from the very beginning, for us, it's the first word, Christ, that leads us into an encapsulation of our faith of what we believe and what we what we hope for. Christ risen. Now for the Jews, for the Jews, some of them didn't believe in any sort of resurrection. Some of them believed that there would be a resurrection, but even those that believed that there would be a resurrection, they believe that it's some time way, way in the future. At the end of time, then there is a resurrection. When we speak about resurrection, we see this very clearly in the exchange between Christ and, and Martha. When Lazarus was in the tomb, when Christ is trying to console her, and Christ tells her that he will raise him up, and she tells him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. At the end of time, not now, not here, it's something that happens at the end, at the end of time. But this resurrection, this resurrection, he is risen. It is always in the present tense. He is risen. You'll be surprised at the amount of time spent by the church, by the fathers, focusing on a verb. Is risen. Not at some future time, not in some la-la land, not anything. It's he is risen now, here and this is, this is focal. This is crucial. 
Because if he is risen, then the promises he made to us are true. Again, back to the gospel of this morning. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him and I will raise him up in the last day. Now I'll come back to this last day in a minute because this can be misunderstood. The response is truly he is risen. Indeed, he is risen. When we're saying that he really rose, we have a very specific understanding of what that means. We don't understand it in a metaphorical sense. We don't understand it in an allegorical sense. We understand it in a very real sense. We understand it through Thomas. We understand the resurrection through the experience of Thomas. As Thomas doubted, Christ told him, come here, put your hand in the wounds. These are real. I was the one who was on the cross, and I am the very same one who is resurrected. Again, this is not the time for a history lesson, but this is one of those things that the church fought very, very hard to maintain, that it's a spiritual body, but it's, it's not a spirit. Our resurrected body is different from a spirit. It is a physicality to it at some level. This here becomes very problematic to everybody back in the day. Because the Jews, those that among them that did believe in the resurrection, didn't believe they would be here and now. For the Gentiles, the pagans, those that did believe in the resurrection, did not believe that it has anything to do with the body. The body is, at best, dirt. The body is something to be discarded. It's the spirit. It's the spirit that has to be preserved. And here, Christianity is saying, no, no, no. We're, this is something completely new. This is something that is revealed by God about how we will be in the future. It is not spirit. And it is not just simply body truly truly risen truly risen this becomes our mantra this becomes the core of our belief that again we we say so frequently but this is fundamentally what puts us at odds with the world the world will accept any other statement other than that other than he is truly resurrected. They will accept, well, it was a spiritual awakening that the disciples had a spiritual awakening and they started understanding the scriptures in a different way. It was a personal experience. It was allegorical. It was metaphorical. It was this, that, and the other thing. It will accept anything. Other than that simple phrase that indeed he is risen. That he is risen objectively. And this goes again to the core, to the core of our faith. For us, this is an encapsulation of the joy that we have over these, these days and these weeks, this long, long Sunday that is Pentecost. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. This is the core. This is the core of not only our faith, but our hope. And again, hope is, in English is, is a lousy term because when you look at the scriptures, when you look at the word of God, what do they mean about hope? This is a very different concept. Yeah. People hope to win the lottery. People hope that they will have a, a, a nice, uh, nice retirement. People hope for a bunch of things. That's not the type of hope the scriptures are speaking about. When we speak about our hope in Christ, we are speaking about our assurance in Christ. This is not a hope built on fanciful wishes. This is a hope based on the deposit that it is 
Christ and his resurrection. He will have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last, the last day. This is why, as Christians, we are not... We are not fearful of disease. We are not fearful of death. We are not fearful of ill fortune. We are not looking forward to those things. We don't enjoy those things. We don't downplay those things. Those are miserable and horrible. But with Christianity, there's that internal assurance. Knowing, knowing that disease ultimately does not matter. That death ultimately does not matter. Why? Because Christ is risen he is risen indeed. At the last day. That phrase comes up frequently, but we do need to understand it very carefully because some, some understand it as, well, you die, you're in something of a coma. Then you're resurrected at the last day. It's kind of a take off of the old Jewish ideas. When we, when we, the faithful, speak about the last day, when we speak about resurrection, we're understanding this through the revelation of, of Christ. When he told the, the thief, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Today, right now. When he is transfigured with Elijah and Moses. He's not transfigured with sleeping people. He's conversing with them. They are conversing with him. If of all churches that know this, I'm sure this is the one that knows that quite well. Christ preaching to the captives during that, that time between the cross and the resurrection. Well, if everybody's comatose, who, who's he preaching to? When we speak about the last day, this is basically when our eyes close from this world and open to the next. Now, there will be the general resurrection. And scholars and theologians discuss the differences between one and the other. And we will find out. We'll find out soon enough. But when we speak about a resurrection, we speak about a resurrection being in the presence of Christ. Instantly once we die, and then... In the general resurrection, this will be the full, the full manifestation of the resurrection with all the heavenly glories. This is the resurrection that we celebrate, but it's also a resurrection that we have, that we have to live. Sometimes when we speak about Christ and his resurrection, we kind of end up with something of a laundry list of, well, he was in the tomb for three days, according to the scriptures, that he are arose, then he went into heaven in the 40th and the 50th. He sensed the part of three. On a very basic level, on a very basic level, we should take our guiding compass from the concluding words of that we always have for the Catholic epistle. Do not love the world nor the things of the world. Our priorities as those who live this mantra of Christ is uh, resurrected. Our priorities have to be different. The priorities of the world are definitely at odds with, with ours. Our priorities are his kingdom, his righteousness, becoming Christ-like, acquiring his virtues. Look at Anything between us and the world. It should be different. It should be different. When we look at morality, our world is stuck in one gear at the moment. Redefining, redefining morality. Redefining marriage. Redefining gender. Redefining sexuality. Redefining everything. This is what our world is, is stuck into. We are at the beginning of a very, very dark time. And this is where Christians need, need to not be belligerent, 
not to be obstinate, but to be aware of what they believe and to hold on to their to their faith. We're in a world in that constantly, constantly speaks about diversity and the importance of diversity and how wonderful diversity is and how it's going to bring a, a great conclusion to everything. Well, diversity until you voice not even a conservative opinion, but something that's somewhat in the realm of a conservative opinion. Our ethos, our, just the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world is self-centered. Our purpose is to be God-centered. That we are his servants, that he is not ours. Some, some cases Christianity gets into this mindset that, well, to pray to God means that I give him my to-do list. God, I want you to X, Y, and Z, and... Typically, at the top of that list are material, material things. We need to be a light unto others by our morality, by our ethics, by our, how we carry ourselves, by the language we use. Again, because we live in a very, very troubling time. Good and evil, right and wrong, are being redefined. This this is earth shaking. This is this is this happens once every couple of thousand years. Basic fundamental ideas about what is right and what is wrong are being redefined. And what's even more troubling is that the things that are being redefined are, are not the trivial things. There is an unending list of trivial things that can be redefined. Fine, redefine all of them. It doesn't matter. You heard it in the Catholic epistle of this morning. There is sin not leading to death, but there is sin that leads on to death. And this is not physical death that the scriptures are speaking about. This is spiritual death. This is the real death. This is the death. And what is being redefined is that sin leading on to death. This is why we have to be very clear in our homes, with our children, with anyone who asks us. It's not about tolerance. It's not about love. And this is the big big issue that comes in. My love to my children, to my spouse, to my relatives, is not to tell them that something that leads to death is life, is love, is acceptance. We interact with all. We love all. We, are, we have our arms open to everyone. We are all sinners. I am at the head of the line. But we cannot redefine what is that sin leading on to death. Because once that happens, then the devil, the devil has his, his way. For centuries upon centuries, even if you are not at all religious, even if you kind of showed up to church during funerals and weddings, If that is your whole experience, society kind of guided you. Yeah, these things are right, these things are wrong, and the things that are labeled as wrong were those sins leading onto death. Now society is is all over the place, all over the place. I had to fill out a survey the other day. It asked about gender. There were nine options One of them, I was kind of savvy. I knew most of those categories. But one of them, to this day, I just don't know what it is. It just, apparently I could belong to an identity group that I don't know exists. Or I don't know that I belong to it. It's becoming, becoming insane. Keep this in mind. 
keep this in mind. When we speak about culture, when we speak about morality, we're not speaking about literal trivial things. Because the world resists us as every step of the word, of the way. That little phrase, he created the male and female. Well, no, no, he did it. He, he, there, there's, very di there's different types of males. There's different types of females. Created male and female. For this, a man shall leave his, wife, uh, his father and mother and leave to his wife. Marriage, no. well, you don't need a male and a female to get married. It, society thinks that's wrong. Abortion. No, no, that's women's rights. You're impeding on people's rights. You can't, you can't do that. Everything that the scripture says is undermined, is twisted. With all of these things, again, we're not speaking about personal preference. My family thinks... Uh, my, my favorite ice cream should not be vanilla. I like vanilla. This is not what we're talking about. When we are speaking about these issues of morality and drawing the line and the issue with culture, we are speaking about these defining and redefining these sins that lead to death, to spiritual death, to final death. Physical death is not a problem. We're all going to die. Newsflash. What matters is that spiritual, that's that second death or that second life. At the very least, we have to be clear with this with our children, with our loved ones. It is also part of this statement that Christ is risen, that we need to share that message. We share, need to share it explicitly, implicitly. But on a very basic level, it has to be shared by our person. Because if our morality does not differ from the world, if our ethics don't differ, if everything we do, our words, our speech, do not differ from the world, then we're not reflecting Christ. We are not showing Christ to the world. And we cannot preach Christ to the world. There's also this idea that in order to, quote unquote, preach Christ, we've got to get on a plane, fly halfway around the world, and stand at a corner with a sign. Do that if you feel so called to it, but wherever you are, this is where you are to reflect Christ. This is where you are to show, to show Christ. There are so many people around us, within our homes, within our families, within our friends, within our co-workers, that we need to see Christ. You don't have to preach their ears off. You don't have to. They just need to see you. And if they see you and they see Christ, you have preached Christ. In some ways, I hate to say it, but we need to preach Christianity to Christians. There is so much out there that has been watered down that is under this umbrella of Christianity. Why are we going to do it? That seems kind of pompous. That seems very self-assured. Why are we going to tell other people? At the very least, we can tell them about a Christianity that does not change every 10 years with the latest social fact. Because if Christianity is founded on the apostles and the chief cornerstone of Christ, then what is taught cannot be changed with the social whims, cannot be changed with the latest social fact. This is the centrality of the message of Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. It's an encapsulation of our faith. It's a celebration of our faith. It's an affirmation of our belief, our hope, 
what we know will happen through the eyes of faith. And that makes it incumbent upon us. That makes it necessary, mandatory for us to share Christ wherever we are. And glory be to God forever.